who uh, organized this meeting. Um, and before I would like to uh, welcome online Rita, and I will apologize again uh, right away by uh, mispronunciation your name, Rita. Uh, Rita Ijak Injai, uh, former special uh, rapporteur on uh, minority issues and currently UNDP senior advisor on anti-racism. Uh, we are very pleased to host this timely meeting uh, under the chapeau of the UN Network on Ra Racial Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. Uh, 20 uh, United Nations entities belong to this network, and we have here our co-hosting uh, speakers from UN Women, UNFPA, UNDP, and OECHR, and uh, they are joined by our civil society collaborators, Minority Rights Group International and Global Forum, of community discriminated and work and uh, dissent. I'm uh, personally uh, encouraged by the renewed prioritization of racial justice at the UN uh, system. I think this is more than uh, timely to uh, for us to focus on this issue. And I've been around for quite some time and I finally see a lot of work uh, in, this, in this area. Um, and, you know, also see that since 2020, the anti-racism movement has reunited. Uh, unfortunately, not for the good reasons, but I'm happy that we are uh, focusing now on this and working on this. Um, I think uh, we have very uh, important anti-racism programmatic um, uh, work, uh, which are very critical because as we all know, we see in different reports, uh, that the 2000, uh, 2030 is failing in many ways, from race to gender. And uh, I think this is an important stock taking. We are currently in the mid point of the 2030 agenda, and it's uh, an important time for us to also assess where we are. And uh, gender is uh, it's uh, an issue, but definitely race and how um, race and gender are interrelated. Uh, we're very pleased also as UN Women that we have now uh, also invest. We have uh, we have here our colleagues. Uh, again, apologies for missing miss. Uh, <laughs> uh, say your name, uh, Muthoni Murui, uh, our senior advisor for diversity, inclusion, and shared leadership, and Marilyn John, our uh, senior racial justice lead. Because I think this is an important step for also for UN Women to push this agenda. Um, we all know there is a long way to go. Uh, we know the numbers, we see the numbers, but we are very encouraged that we also know uh, what is needed and what how we're gonna get there. Um, we feel energized and I hope this morning uh, conversations will be about some promising practices and invite your active participation here and online. Um, and I look forward to the rich presentations and to your participation today. Thank you. And once again, welcome to UN Women. Great. Thank you, Katarina, for that warm welcoming. Can I invite this, the panelists to sit at the table, please? Someone on Zoom just said there's an empty table there. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right, and so while our panelists, all of them uh, that are in the room, please uh, come to the front and, and sit at the table. Um, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. And again, welcome for those joining us both virtually and here present um, physically. Uh, so my name is Patricia da Silva, and I am a program advisor and the global lead for the United Nations Population Fund Initiative on People of African Descent. Um, I really want to start by telling you that this event was this event was meant to be moderated by uh, our UNDP colleague um, and uh, former Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Rita Ijak Njaye. Uh, who unfortunately for reasons beyond her control was not able to make it here to New York this week, unfortunately. So clearly impossible shoes to fill, um, but we fortunately that we will have the opportunity to uh, hear Rita um, at, the end, at the end of our event. So again, 
I, I, I joined uh, Katarina in um, thanking Rita for all her, her efforts to put together this uh, really important event. And so um, this event was organized under the chapeau of the United Nations Network on Racial Discrimination and Protection of, Prote of Minorities. The network unites over 20 UN departments, agencies, programs, and funds to raise awareness, advocate for change, build capacity, and tackle racial discrimination, including issues of multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. And we will hear more about the work of the network from our, from our speakers here. So Katerina just alluded to it, but uh, since 2020, the UN efforts on anti-racism work has come under scrutiny. This, this has led to some introspection about our capacity and our commitment to protect people who faces racism and racial discrimination, both within our organization, the ones we work with itself, and also in our programs. So the UN General uh, Secretary General launched a campaign of dialogues and action against racism, with which ended with the establishment of the task force on addressing racism and promoting dignity for all in the United Nations. Um, while the United Nations system strives to improve our respective organizations internal framework on diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is evident to all of us that work here um, that socioeconomic disparity is compounded by systemic racism and discrimination uh, widen the gap in accomplishing our vision on leaving no one behind and securing the sustainable development goals for all without discrimination. Indeed, a 2022 report from the Joint Ex Inspection Unit underscores the urgent need to assess the systemic and structural dimensions of racism and racial discrimination that are uh, embedded in programmatic and operational activities. And so we are here today with, with, with a, sense, a sense of urgency. And we are also acutely aware that while some progress has been made, um, and we'll hear um, about that, that, that progress uh, today, we, we do still have a long way to go. And we have a huge task ahead of us. But we are also extremely determined. And again, Katarina just said that we are very determined and unwavering in our commitment to fight racism and promote the protection of minorities. So in this context, we appreciate that the political declaration that was just adopted at the high level political forum commits to stepping up efforts to fight racism and all forms of, of, uh, of discrimination. This is a very important step in our collective efforts to protect and fulfill human rights and support sustainable development for all. So today we will continue in our reflection of our work in fighting racism and discrimination. Uh, it is an opportunity to share current efforts, good and promising practices, uh, and innovative examples of programming which contribute to addressing racism and racial discrimination and to the protection of minorities. So we hope that this will inspire further action and contribute to accelerating our efforts in this regard. We will examine what has worked and what more we must do uh, to ensure that inclusion of groups affected by racial discrimination so that solutions are grounded in their lived experiences. So finally, just for some house, house rules, um, I will request our uh, esteemed panelists to make their presentations in under six minutes. Um, uh, and then at the end of the presentation, the panelists will open the discussions for um, uh, for Q&A, for questions and answers, uh, both from people here in the room and from uh, our friends and guests that have uh, joined us virtually. And so for our virtual attendants, we encourage you to use the Zoom chat function uh, to submit your questions and comments. Uh, and those questions will be passed to me and I will ask, um, I will ask our panelists to respond. Um, and then for those that are here, just raise your hand and we will identify you um, to answer, uh, for the panelists to answer your questions. Uh, great, so now to kick off, we will hear from our colleague from the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights, Mr. Herman Vallis. Herman leads the Indigenous Peoples and Minority Section at the Office of the 
OECHR, which works on the implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples and minorities, focusing on the implementation of their rights through support, mm -hmm. research, and interagency cooperation. Ehrman was unable to join us in person, so we will hear his pre-recorded remarks. technology. Good morning, colleagues. I am very pleased to be able to address today's side event on behalf of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. The network provides an interagency platform to address racial discrimination and the protection of minorities, as well as multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination through awareness raising, through advocacy, and through capacity building. The network brings together more than 20 UN departments, agencies, programs, and funds. OHCHR acts as permanent co-chair of the network. During 2023, we are proud to join with the Office of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Today's event is timely and important. A core overall aim of the network is above all to move and mobilize UN action on the ground to address racial discrimination and strengthen protection of minorities in programming and in practice. This aim faces entrenched challenges due to the fact that in many places, addressing these fundamental human rights is hindered by political sensitivities. The extent of this problem is set in 2021 research by the network, which identified systemic underattention to racial discrimination and protection of minorities in the UN's efforts at country level in a number of countries and regions. As a result of action by the network, I am happy to report that things are beginning to change. During 2021 and 2022, OHCHR supported financially UN country teams to address racial discrimination and protection of minorities in Brazil, Cameroon, the Dominican Republic, Kyrgyzstan, Laos, Madagascar, Nepal, Panama, Sri Lanka, and Venezuela. In addition, we have provided extensive guidance to UNCTs on advancing work in these areas, including a checklist to strengthen UN work at country level to combat discrimination and advanced minority rights, available in a number of languages. An online training package on addressing racial discrimination and strengthening protection of minorities, indigenous peoples, and other population groups in UN programming processes. And a guidance note on intersectionality, racial discrimination, and protection of minorities, together with regular community of practice meetings, in particular aspects of inter and anti-racism and minority inclusion, led by expert UN colleagues from relevant agencies. We invite you to see the UN Network website for these resources. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is at the forefront of efforts to address the twin scourges of racial discrimination and the exclusion of minorities. In addition to our support for mainstreaming anti-racism and minority protection work across the UN, done via the network, several flagship efforts in this regard merit comment. In December of last year, for example, OECHR and the NGO Equal Rights Trust published Protecting Minority Rights, a practical guide to developing comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. The guide aims to support anyone working to answer the call of the Secretary General to strengthen anti-discrimination law at country level. During 2023 and 2024, we will work with UN country teams worldwide to advance the development, adoption, and implementation of comprehensive anti-discrimination laws. This year, OHCHR has deployed regional advisors on combating racial discrimination and the protection of minorities, including people of African descent in Bangkok, Beirut, Brussels, and Santiago. We also support minority indigenous and people of African descent human rights defenders as fellows and senior fellows, both at the UN headquarters and in UN field offices worldwide. 
This work aims to give minority human rights defenders the skills to use the UN human rights system effectively to advance inclusion agendas and to challenge human rights abuse. Also, since 2019, we have dedicated increasing focus on minority artists as human rights defenders, profiling the work of minority artists since last year. This list could go on. United Nations efforts to end racial discrimination and to secure genuine minority inclusion are far from completed, however. Political, capacity, practical and resource challenges are daunting. Nevertheless, we are confident that working together, we can bring about real, durable, positive change for peace, prosperity and inclusion including for those most at risk of being left behind. Today's event, which examines UN programming efforts in these areas, is an important step on that road. We very much look forward to the conclusions of today's deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Erman. Uh, yes, our work is far from completed, but it's it's heartwarming to hear that things are beginning to change. Uh, we thank you OACHR and their efforts and their important work of protecting human rights for uh, uh, minorities around the world. So this is a perfect segue uh, because I'm now going to introduce my uh, my colleague, um, Emily, um, Senior Human Rights Advisor. Uh, Emily Firmo wilson does a really great job uh, providing leadership at UNFPA in capacity building and advisory support to UNFPA human rights efforts, including to leave anyone behind, and advances research on the nexus between women's rights and sexual and reproductive health. Emily will present some of UNFPA's efforts in target programming, like our work on people of African descent, for example, but also our efforts to create tools to mainstream the Leave No One Behind framework, framework, including fighting racism and discrimination um, across UNFPA programming. Emily, take it away. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I think this is working now. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, firstly, let me start by thanking the network for making this event possible and for inviting uh, UNFPA, the UN Population Fund, to be here to share our work and our programming in this area. At UNFPA, we have an ambitious vision for leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest behind. And our work on anti-racism, on protection of minorities, is integral to this work and to our ambitious vision. And before we go into, I go into the more specific details about our programming on anti-racism and protection minorities, I think it's important to uh, give the broader context for our work on leaving no one behind and talk about the real challenges that we face as a UN entity in taking this work forward in a, in a more transformative, meaningful way. And so starting off, you know, work on leaving no one behind for UNFPA has been something that has been at the forefront of our work for many years. And our previous strategic plan and, and this current strategic plan actually anchored leaving no one behind in a much more explicit way, which made it more of a priority and more explicit priority for our work. But then uh, when we were reviewing our previous strategic plan and, and evaluating its results, we found that almost all our indicators related to leaving no one behind were off target. We weren't meeting that ambition. And there were some real challenges in the organization for working intentionally in this area. And we wanted to better understand you know, what those challenges were. And we did this internal assessment and then work to better strength our organizational response to leaving no one behind. And we actually work with minority rights group uh, in doing that. And we realized, is, we realized we needed to make three fundamental shifts in both our understanding and our approach. The first shift is getting to clarity on what we mean by leaving no one behind. Because when we're asking what that means, a lot of people have very vague understandings. And our country officers, we would ask them, and some of them may say, well, we're working on leaving no one behind because we're working with women and girls. And 
our shift is saying, okay, women and girls are an important priority for us, but we need to look at the intersection of gender and other exclusionary factors, factors such as race, ethnicity, and looking at how those intersect and create disadvantage. So first is shifting our understanding of leaving no one behind to looking at those intersections, gender and other factors, having clarity on that. Secondly is recognizing the power of exclusion. Are these populations left behind or are they pushed behind? And understanding it as often it's a case of being pushed behind, it changes the approach that you take because it's not the fact, it's not the case that they have just been forgotten or you know, they, they, they weren't able to make it to this meeting, but they're actually powerful forces pushing and excluding these populations. And if we understand the power of exclusion, our interventions have to be more targeted and, under, and address those underlying structural issues. So shifting that understanding from left behind to being pushed behind. And with that said, we needed a vision. We need a vision for UNFPA. And we came up with our vision and our vision is that those furthest behind enjoy sexual and reproductive health rights as UNFPA explicitly prioritizes addressing intersectional, persistent, and extreme disadvantages, discrimination, and disempowerment. So with that ambitious vision, how do we translate it into practice? Well, first, as UNFPA, we have a key role in making the invisible visible. We know that a lot of um, the challenges in addressing discrimination, racism, is that those populations are often invisible because the data isn't counting them. And we just did a, an event and two of our panelists were, were part of that event just on Sunday on leaving no one behind data and pushing data, advocating that data should be disaggregated by race, by ethnicity, by religious um, minorities, so that we can better understand and, and know and then address and target those populations that are furthest behind. So that is advocacy work that we do at the global level, but at the country level, we have a key role in our work on national population data systems. So in Kenya, for example, we were working with the National Statistics Office and the National Census and advocating for more disaggregation, which led to the first time that the census was disaggregated by more than one indigenous populations, one than more in indigenous group. In Brazil, we were really excited. And, and on Sunday at the event, we had representations from Brazil who shared you know, the work that we've been doing to support the national census um, to better cover the, the Quilomba people in the national census. And it wasn't only uh, covering the Quilombo populations, but the methodology that we use. We use a methodology that was culturally access acceptable and respectable of the Quilombo people. We were supporting um, also Brazil in their national census, developing a, a distinct census for indigenous populations. And it was really interesting to hear from them how between the last time that the indigenous peoples were covered in the census in 2010, to now in 2023, there was an increase of 80% in indigenous populations. And it wasn't that those populations have, have um, grown hugely, it's just that they were better counted. So being able to count and make visible um, those populations is critical. And then we use it for advocacy. And I'm proud to share this uh, assessment that we just released at the beginning of the summer on maternal health of women and girls of African descent in the Americas. And using the data that we have, we found that there was systematic racism and sexism that led to women um, of African descent being systematically having poorer um, maternal health outcomes. And so we, we look at what those structural causes um, are including the lack of data because we were only able to use data from nine countries because that was all that was available uh, for us to analyze. We did something similar um, a few more years again with UN Women uh, and UNICEF on indigenous women for maternal health. And there we were really shocked by the lack of data from the 90 um, DHS and mixed surveys, so the different population surveys, there were only eight countries that had disaggregated 
by indigeneity that we were analyzed and that we could use. So you're going from 90 countries to having only half of those that dis disaggregate data by ethnicity. And then if you want to use that for indigeneity, is it published, is it analyzed, you only have eight. So there's a huge challenge in data, and that is something that is a priority for us. So um, once you've supported making the invisible visible, we've also got to then address the systematic structural issues that lead to that exclusion. And this is more the targeted programming that we take and we work on. And recognizing in particular the disproportionate burden of Afri on, on Afro-descent women and girls in support of the implementation of the program of activities of the international decade of people of African descent. We rolled out in 2019 um, a, a dedicated program aimed at advancing rights and justice of people of African descent, which Patricia very ably um, leads within the organization. And it's has many aims, but one of them is to work on advocacy, of which this analysis is part of, but then also programming and different communication initiatives within the organization and outside, and partnership with different organizations representing persons of African descent is critical to advancing that work. Secondly, um, you know, as part of those efforts in our programming, we found that in our country offices, we weren't systematically identifying who was furthest behind in the context of what we call our three transformative results. So maternal health, family planning, gender-based violence. And we've introduced a tool for all of our countries. So going into a country that we're systematically looking, um, doing an analysis of the factors. We, we've, we've come up with eight core factors that we know are critical to, or often have a role of putting persons and groups at risk of being left behind. And we ask our country officers to systematically analyze how those factors are impacting our three transformative results. But then not only is that analysis, analysis important, our, our country officers find one of the biggest challenge is how do you prioritize? When you're working with limited resources in a country, there are many factors that push different populations and individual groups behind. And so this tool is also a tool which asks key questions to help us prioritize. What is the political environment? What are the other organizations doing in this area? Do we have the partnerships with civil society organizations that can help us reach those groups? So being able to do this more intentionally, systematically, and based on clear priorities within the organization um, is has been important for our programming. And that's a, a path and that we've just started and we look forward to getting more experience in and, and, and rolling out further. But all and all of this work has an important human rights dimension. So the engagement with the international human rights mechanisms is key. And you know, when we're talk, we were just talking with our family planning colleagues, and they have, for example, developed country profiles on countries related to uptake of family planning. And we realize that in those country profiles, you know, one of the, the big challenges is the qualitative information that helps you identify. You know, the inequalities there. And this is where we we we're now introducing the recommendations of human rights mechanisms that often identify those groups that are furthest behind. Could also be in the case of, for example, child marriage, talking about Roma populations in our in our um countries in Eastern Europe. But those recommendations provide a really helpful advocacy tool for us and can help us negotiate a space with uh, our national partners that is not always easy uh, to do, but with the authority of human rights norms, we can do so with more confidence and um, in a more strategic way. And lastly, um, let me end by saying that even though, you know, in this, this meeting, we're focusing on external programming, what happens internally is also extremely important. And you can't separate the two. And I think for UNFPA, we have a new people's strategy, um, which uh, brings an in inclusion and diversity essential to that. We also have introduced the first young professional um, program for young, prof uh, for young professionals of African descent to be in our organization and have 
uh, post for them. And that's really important for messaging. It's also really important for our own expertise to have more people with lived in experiences um, of exclusion who can represent these issues in a more powerful way. And for that, also leadership is key. I think the fact that our executive director is Emily, a woman can we, can of we wrap up? <laughs> is extremely powerful message for us and for young people who want to work with UNFPA to see how seriously we work both internally and externally um, on, on racism and protection of minorities. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, and, and I just wanna really amplify a couple of points. Uh, this idea of intentionality, things do not happen if we do not put our clear intention on making these meaningful and transformative change. And also just that last piece of the data, we had at an event like Emily mentioned on, sun, on, on Sunday, really highlighting this lack of data disaggregated by many factors, but including gender and race and ethnicity. And we need this data and we cannot tell you how important it is that we continue to advocate for this disaggregation of data. Um, so I, I will move on uh, now. And I would like to pass the floor to our colleague from the United Nations Development Program, Ms. Ravai Mankanke Albiki. Let's have some grace on the pronunciation. <laughs> um, Ravai serves as the Senior Advisor for Justice and Security at UNDP and brings over 20 years of expertise in human rights and the protection of vulnerable groups. Great to have you. Thank you so much uh, for having us. And I'm truly delighted on behalf of UNDP to be part of this event and also take this opportunity to share some of the institutional shifts that we are making in UNDP as part of our renewed efforts and our renewed energy to really reinvigorate when it comes to our investments on anti-racism and protection of minorities and anti-discrimination. So first of all, I would like to just start by acknowledging that we are really at a critical juncture right now. When we look at the SDGs report that was released in July, I think evidence is abundant and clear that we are backtracking on a number of indicators under the SDGs or some of the progress has stalled significantly. So while we are at this particular point where we are acknowledging the challenges that we are facing, I think it's also an opportune time for us now to be able to say, how do we best galvanize global, national, local energy to be able to return the tide on these negative trends that we are seeing at the current moment? I would also like, I think as part of opening this conversation on behalf of UNDP, to also acknowledge in many ways the multiple intersecting crises that are really driving some of the challenges that we are facing. Obviously, climate change and the climate emergency, we are talking about the impact of COVID-19, both social, economic, and political. We are talking also about the, um, the economic uh, uh, um, crisis that uh, we are facing globally. But when you think about all of these factors, think also about how much all of this have affected everybody globally, but also think about racialized minorities and also think more significantly about those whom we pledged in 2015 to not leave behind. So in terms of thinking about, of course, this bleak picture, but how it can be turned around, I'm also pleased really to share with you some of the innovative and, and strategic changes that UNDP has been leading globally in terms of, uh, of governizing its work. First of all, I'll talk about the two directions of change that we are working with. The first one has been internal, and I want to acknowledge also the point that Emily raised, because I think it is also about how we organize ourselves internally as institutions that is also part of driving the change externally. Under the leadership of our administrator, who is the head of UNDP, in 2020, we reinvigorated the conversation around racism within UNDP with the aim of creating a more diverse and more inclusive workforce. And I think that by itself, I think, was the beginning of showing of the importance of the political commitment to make this work much more important and much more meaningful and also visible within the work uh, uh, of UNDP. Additionally, with this particular important of work having been launched, there was also the establishment of an advisory group on anti-racism and anti-discrimination, which was again an additional layer of emphasizing the importance of making these changes. 
The second direction of change for us, which we are finding much more critical and much more important, focuses on the actual programming of the work of UNDP, the policy work and also the programmatic work. Why do I think this is important? And I'll tell you why. UNDP operates in 170 countries and contexts which are developmental crisis context, context where there is fragility, context where there are ongoing conflicts. Besides working in all these 170 countries, even by way of annual investments in programming, we're talking of volume of close to $5 billion of investments. Now think about the opportunities that exist when it comes to creating the potential investments around anti-racism and anti-discrimination. So under the leadership of Rita, who is unfortunately not uh, with us physically in the room today, but is online, who is our senior advisor on anti-racism and anti-discrimination, a comprehensive assessment exercise was done for UNDP's entire programming to try to pin down on where are the investments on anti-racism protection of minorities and anti-discrimination uh, placed? Where are the gaps? And what are some of the opportunities that exist for us to be able to push forward this work in a much more strategic, intentional manner? And I want to also emphasize again for UNDP, the word intentional has become very, very critical and important, meaning there has to be accountability as well. So it's not really just about putting words in a document. There are also accountability mechanisms to ensuring that the implementation happens. And with that said, um, not that everything came out uh, um, with a, a bleak picture as we are seeing with the SDGs, but we were able to highlight quite a number of interesting nuggets of work that are being done. And I'm just going to highlight some of these few transformative shifts that have been happening. For us, the first one, the strategic plan itself, our strategic plan 2022 to 2025 is very clear in terms of UNDP's political, programmatic and policy commitment when it comes to anti-racism, protection of human rights and anti-discrimination with specific indicators to measure the efforts of the whole institution and to be able to be held accountable, not only with to the populations that we serve in the 170 countries, but also to the executive board, which holds us accountable to the utilization of the resources that we receive and invest uh, in the different um, our countries. And at a programmatic level, also interesting examples came through, like for example, from Bangladesh, our human rights programming in Bangladesh is dedicated to the outcome of strengthening national partners to better protect the rights of ethnic minorities with a specific focus on reducing some of the structural inequalities and some of the structural challenges. Our work in Iraq, which is very highly complex, and I think the rest of the other UN agencies operating in this space can testify to that, but we have really worked much more intentionally to invest in supporting minority communities in particular in the work around security sector and justice reforms, and to ensuring that those who are, are much left behind are integrated in the work uh, that is being done on access to justice and, and, and security um, uh, and community security. A justice and legal empowerment project UNDP has been implementing in Vietnam has been ensuring that legal information and materials are translated into ethnic minority, minority languages to promote access to information and securing at least up to 90% of ethnic minority participation in the various projects and ensuring legal awareness along the way. There are many, many other examples that I could cite which really highlighted these impactful opportunities, but impactful ways of engaging. We have one important um, initiative in UNDP called the Small Grants Project, which is really about investing at community level. And again, this has been one of the key instruments that UNDP has been using, in particular when we talk about the language of leaving no one behind. Recently, UNDP was evaluated on its performance, by the way, on leaving no one behind. And again, we managed to get insightful uh, 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 evidence from that report on what we are doing right and what we need 
to improve on. And again, as we acknowledge that we are at this point of reflection, we do acknowledge areas that also need improvement. I will uh, conclude by speaking to two key points. One relates to the issue also of knowledge, right, evidence, public and, and, and data. Um, UNDP working with uh, the Oxford uh, Poverty and Human Development Initiative did a global multidimensional index report called Unmasking Disparities by Ethnicity, Caste and Gender produced in 2021. And that report was also quite instrumental in terms of again showing some of the key disparities that we are experiencing while at the same time, I think emphasizing on the key points of what needs to be done. The Human Development Report, UNDP produced, yes, I'm about to conclude, in 2022 also did uh, highlight, you know, some of the, the paradox of how, you know, in this 21st century, so much has changed in the positive, but yet similarly, a lot has not happened when it comes to issues around security and protection of the rights of racialized minorities. It spotlighted, I think, some of these key challenges and how much we need to improve our efforts and to do better. I will conclude by saying we have the instruments to enable us to be much more intentional, to be held accountable, and I think it is critical that we are able to do this. I will conclude by um, citing the words of uh, our UNDP administrator, Akim Steiner, who said to eradicate poverty, we must eradicate racial injustice and inequality. To this end, anti-racism efforts are central to UNDP's support across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Irva. I, I like that you concluded about three times, but yeah. you know, it works. It works. <laughs> it keeps us in suspense. Um, anyway, but really, thank you for sharing your experiences. And indeed, I think it's important for us to remember the compounded um, impact of the mega trends, including climate and others that you mentioned, on those that are already left behind and, and marginalized. That's a very, very important point. Um, so now I'm joining us virtually is Anastasia Divinsky. Divinskaya. Anastasia has been UN Women's Country Representative in Brazil since 2019 and previously served as country rep in the Ukraine and Timor Leste. Uh, with a career spanning over 20 years, she's an expert in human rights, gender equality, and financing for gender equality, uh, having also served in UN Women and the UNDP in Kyrgyzstan. Anastasia, it's great to have you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure indeed to join you for this uh, very important side event and to share the experience of UN women in applying the intersectional approach to our country programming by sharing the, uh, a, a very practical examples on how we operationalize this uh, uh, in Brazil at the level of the country. Uh, office. So uh, I prepared a very brief presentation to uh, which I am sharing now. So in Brazil, we uh, proudly claim that uh, our uh, country program is not only human rights based, which is natural because it's a programmatic standard programmatic tool, but also we systematically ap uh, apply the intersectional analysis uh, for strategic uh, program project planning, our policy advice, uh, integrated uh, policy and normative advice, capacity development, social mobilization and advocacy. And uh, today I would like to share with you the uh, methodology which we apply, the strategies, the tools, and some snapshot of the results. So uh, uh, what you see at the screen is apparently our very simple uh, intersectional framework for program action and for program planning. Uh, so it's very simplistic as you can see, but what is important is that uh, it's a live document which is uh, constantly updated based on the new data which we have, which is produced by the uh, human rights treaty bodies uh, through the concluding observations, recommendations, special procedures, but also based on our own studies, uh, studies of the civil society and academia in Brazil. So we apply this systematically and coherently across the entire country program, program planning but also across the newly developed projects and programs which we implement. So why? Uh, what does it do for us and for our practical implementation of the program? First of all, it guides us uh, in our analysis. It helps us to understand how this intersecting and discrimination hinders development and the realization of human rights of, of the specific 
groups uh, in the areas of our work uh, uh, here at the um, country office level. And it also informs our decisions about the choices which we make about the programmatic focus, about the uh, cooperation with various duty bearers uh, uh, um, in all three uh, branches of power, as well as the choice uh, and, uh, in terms of partnership with the rights holders and civil society. And as I have already mentioned, uh, this uh, tool is informed by the uh, and co constantly updated based on the human uh, rights treaty bodies and special uh, procedures, uh, information and reports. So uh, I will uh, explain to you how we apply de facto uh, this instrument through one of our projects, which is called Connecting Women Defending Rights. This is the project which was launched to protect the rights of women human rights defenders. Uh, during the very gloomy period of the marginalization, a uh, political marginalization of gender equality and human rights during the previous administration. So it's our flagship program, which we are very uh, uh, proud of. So uh, we started the implementation of this project applying the same intersectionality framework, having identified the main grounds uh, of discrimination faced by our primary beneficiaries and partners. And uh, this intersection of race, gender, ethnicity, religious identity, and uh, their role as women human rights defenders brought us to the conclusion uh, uh, about, uh, no, through analysis of how uh, this uh, intersecting discrimination manifests itself and how um, who would be our primary uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, beneficiaries. So those uh, in our programming are uh, the uh, indigenous women from the specific uh, um, peoples, Kiowa and Guarani, uh, who live in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, which borders with, the, uh, with Paraguay. Uh, in, uh, this is the state with the second largest indigenous population in entire Brazil and uh, the state with the highest uh, numbers of killings and murders of indigenous people, suicide rates among indigenous people, as well as the highest rates of incarcerated uh, indigenous population and uh, indigenous people deprived of the freedom in the entire country. So historically, Guarani and Kiowa people have been victims of the state-sponsored so-called expansion to the West, uh, having been deprived of their traditional lands uh, uh, for the benefit of the soy, orange, and cattle breeding agriculture. So at the moment, uh, Kiowa and Guarani people live in the so-called retaken uh, uh, territories and struggle with traditional agri agriculture because over decades of the exploitation of their uh, traditional lands uh, for soy and other types of agriculture, the soil is depleted and moreover, uh, their settlements are subject to frequent attacks, shooting, and arsons uh, allegedly committed by the nearby farmers and criminal gangs. So this is the overall perspective uh, and the context uh, where we implement the projects. And against this background of the gener general violation of human rights of Guarani and Kiowa uh, people, indigenous uh, uh, Kiowa and Guarani women and girls experience widespread intersectional discrimination and various forms of violence based on their ethnicity, uh, gender, race, and re religious identity. Guarani and Kiowa people are highly spiritual people, with most communities having their prayer houses, Casa da Reza, and religious leaders. Their women, female uh, religious leaders, Nyendesis, have been uh, the targets of the uh, uh, attacks and have been um, experiencing the tremendous increase in violence and murders, including murders. Uh, and predominantly those are caused by the advance of the evangelical church and the neo-Pentecostal religions. The, att the attacks frequent and take forms of threats, hate speech, uh, acts of public humiliation, physical violence, stigmatization of their traditional women's um, uh, uh, religious role in the community. And the doctrine preached in those uh, communities by the churches is intolerant towards indigenous spirituality and demonizes and discredits uh, the Guarani and Kiowa traditional spirituality. So uh, that is the general context and the entry point uh, uh, based on the intersectional analysis which we uh, uh, conducted, which led us to development of the strategies and the uh, uh, program uh, formulation to address uh, these causes. So deeply rooted structural inequalities, uh, racism, religious intolerance, religious extremism, and what we call the religious racism, as well as the systemic acts of violence uh, uh, against uh, women spiritual leaders and human rights defenders in these communities, as well as the lack of official data, neither at the federal level, nor at the community or state level, as well as the absence of policy 
conferences which would be dedicated to the issues of human rights of indigenous women or violence against them, served as a ground and a starting point for our partnership with the uh, uh, indigenous women's organizations. And uh, partnerships with them was uh, the starting point and the core strategy which we applied uh, in our planning and implementation. So uh, we started with the social mobilization, awareness raising and building capacity of Kiowa and Guarani women and importantly the surrounding communities. So it was the whole community approach about the international indigenous human rights uh, frameworks, about the state obligations, about the rights of the duty bearers and the uh, raising the, uh, building their capacity to advocate for the sake of claiming their rights. Uh, as I can, to yes. start wrapping up, please. Yes, I will. Uh, this is the last slide, apparently. So, uh, uh, as I have already mentioned, the absence of data uh, was uh, one of the key issues, and uh, therefore the data generation was one of the strategies which were applied. So we. Uh, also, I'm, I, I'm uh, very proud that we managed to pilot the very innovative way of uh, documentation and mapping of cases of violence, engaging the Nyandesis, the religious leaders and women uh, from this community themselves. Uh, this is how we ended with three editions of the mapping, as well as the, uh, this May, uh, this year in May, we released the first dossier about the um, racism and religious uh, intolerance uh, perpetrated against these women. So these documents now serve as a reference for the political mobilization and for the evidence-based advocacy by those groups, but also they are applied by the government for their decision making. So as a result of this, so first of all, Guarani and Kiowa women have become um, uh, 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 managed to integrate the uh, uh, violence against women in the mainstream uh, prior uh, priorities of the mainstream indigenous uh, uh, rights movement in Brazil and indigenous women's rights in Brazil. Before that, violence has never been there. So uh, 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 oh, I have already mentioned the political mobilization. So we facilitated the engagement with the uh, Congress and with the government. And in 2023, with the new administration, we finally have seen the policy and the institutional shift such as the commitment of the government and the location of resources for establishing first ever in the history of Brazil, shelters for indigenous women um, uh, in all six biomes, uh, organizing the um, uh, hearings uh, with so-called traveling ombudsmen around all the beyonds and uh, other means of consulting women and engaging them in public policy making. And with this, I'm thanking you for, uh, for attention and uh, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, UN Women, for the work that you're doing. And thank you for also highlighting the importance of intersectional approach. People is multidimensional, and it's important to recognize the multiple intersecting forms of discrimination they face that contribute to, to leaving them uh, behind. Colleagues, I'm going to ask you to please try to stick with time. We want to have a really rich conversation with everyone that is here and in online. Uh, so um, Lark, better effort to keep with to those uh, to those six minutes, please. But I mean, I am really, really pleased now to be able to introduce uh, the Global Forum of Communities Discriminated on Work and Dissent. It is the global coordination and engagement mechanism for the stakeholder group of communities discriminated at work and dissent. It supports the 2030 agenda under the core motto of leave no one behind, and engages and coordinates marginalized communities, organizations united by a central structure and shared values, vision, and mission. And here to deliver a joint statement on behalf of the Global Forum, allow me to introduce three very important and notable speakers uh, from its member uh, organizations. And um, I'll start with Verselini Diaz, the legal advisor of CONAC, uh, Confederation of National Association of Quilombola, in Brazil. Welcome, great to see you again. Uh, Simona Torotkoi, a representative of Ergo, European Roma Grassroots Organization in Romania. Welcome, Simona. And Bina Palikal is a Dalit woman leader and currently general secretary of the National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights. And so they will read uh, together uh, a statement on behalf of the organization. Thank you again all for being here. Thank you very much. I will start on behalf of uh, our uh, global forum. So first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, we are very happy to present the voice of civil society. 
So what is uh, the Global Forum of Communities Discriminated on Work and Descent? Well, we represent communities across the world that face a similar type of discrimination. So we have Roma from Europe, Dalits from South Asia, Buraku from Japan, uh, Kilambola from Latin America, Brazil, Pelenque as well, Haratins from West Africa. So it's a whole community that faces the similar struggles of discrimination. Together, we are about 270 million. But allow me please to share, you more, share with you more about what is this discrimination based on work and descent so we have a good understanding. And I will quote from the draft principles and guidelines for the effective elimination of discrimination based on work and descent. So discrimination based on work and descent is any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on inherited status such as caste, including present and ancestral occupation, family, community, or social origin, name, birth, place of residence, dialect, and accent that has the purpose or effect to nullify or impairing the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise, or an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, or any other field of public life. This type of discrimination is typically associated with the notion of purity and pollution and practices of untouchability and is deeply rooted in societies and cultures where this discrimination is practiced. So we, um, um, as I said, we represent um, um, these communities and um, it is clearly based on our evidence and the research that we have done so far that we are most, uh, among the most marginalized and excluded. Um, and um, I just want to share with you um, some of the experiences of, of Roma women. I, as I said, I, I'm, I'm a Roma myself. Um, so we uh, experience intersectional discrimination and oppression because of this overlapping um, social uh, constructs. But also we can see that um, this type of discrimination that affects um, community, uh, women belonging to communities discriminated in work and descent and, and Roma has very specific manifestations. So um, in Europe, in many countries, Roma women um, are going to uh, family practice centers or hospitals, but are kept waiting, ignored, not given the attention that they deserve, or they're even sometimes rejected by the health personnel. Um, Roma girls are segregated in, in schools um, and discriminated against, and therefore their risk of dropping out of school is really high. Many Roma women um, are mostly um, present in the informal sector in jobs such as um, scrap or paper correcting, flower selling, and cleaning. We need decent jobs, not only for Roma, but for uh, communities discriminated in work and descent. The main challenge that we are facing it's um, mainly the lack of presence of CWD women uh, in key policy documents and frameworks. So we really uh, encourage the UN system and its agencies to recognize um, women from communities discriminated or working descent and adopt an intersectional approach in all its forms and policies, both within the UN, but also um, in their programs and maybe establish a working group uh, to examine the status uh, and current gaps in the protection of uh, CWD women. And I'll give the floor to Bina. Thanks, Simona. And uh, thank you to all the co-panelists and the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Simona has mostly said about the larger CDWD uh, communities. Uh, I'll just focus on the Dalit community because I come from the Dalit community. Um, a couple of years ago, a young girl uh, went to the field to um, uh, to help her mother to uh, collect firewood for her, uh, you know, for and and to work in the fields with her parents. And uh, she was a young Dalit girl who was uh, then uh, raped, gang raped, and killed. Um, and later, the state colluded with. Um, uh, with the dominant caste community that did this, uh, the state colluded and then cremated her body without permission of the family or without actually the family um, uh, getting any kind of uh, you know con consent from the family. This became later the huge issue globally as well. It's the Hathras, the case that happened in Hathras. I think many of you must have read about it. 
this is a daily occurrence where violence and exclusion continues to uh, you know continues to plague this uh, the community dalit community across uh, according to the national crime records bureau there's about 50000 cases registered uh, every year uh, cases that are the dominant caste on dalit communities but i'm not here to just tell you about the issues that we are facing uh, but it's not just violence it's also exclusion from services exclusion from technology you know we are here uh, we are uh, we are on zoom people are watching us on zoom but there are many community uh, there are many people who in the dalit community who don't own smartphones you know during covid the entire country went into uh, online mode uh, but at the same time you know people uh, the uh, it was great that you know in india classes were held online but the fact of the matter is that dalits couldn't attend that one year uh, one year of um, classes because they did not have access to technology so just two recommendations and i'll stop thank you uh, one is we, uh, we need to ensure that we we talk about actions but to for those actions to actually become reality we need budgetary provisions and uh, you know so we need to put money where where the action has to be and the implementation so and also we need to ha have the people discriminated on work and dissent including dalits at the table when we are formulating policies thank you É, obrigada. Eu vou falar agora sobre a questão das comunidades quilombolas no Brasil, né? Thank you very much. And now I'll talk about the quilombola communities in Brazil. É, a CONAC é uma organização que tem mais de 37 anos, né? E foi fundada justamente para lutar pela desigualdade contra e contra o racismo contra as comunidades quilombolas. So my organization, CONAC, uh, was created 37 years ago, and it was created specifically to fight racism inside the community. Apesar de é, hoje é, no Brasil existem mais, quase 6 mil comunidades quilombolas em todo o território nacional. So in Brazil we have around 6000 communities in all national territory. E é a primeira vez que o governo oficialmente contabiliza a, a população quilombola no país no censo do IBGE que foi colocado já aqui pelos em anterior. So it was the first time that uh, IBGE, the census of Brazil, really contabilize our communities. É, apesar de ser um grupo misto, em 2016, a, a, a CONAC sentiu a necessidade de é, desfag, desfragmentar, né, tratar é, políticas específicas dentro do movimento e criou-se o coletivo de mulheres por duas razões, por várias razões entre elas, especialmente duas. So we felt the necessity um, uh, a short time ago to create a specific women group inside the Quilombola communities. A primeira, a, 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 o grande índice de exploração sexual e de trabalho de meninas quilombolas. So the first reason to create this specific group of women was the exploitation, exploitation, sexual exploitation of women that we, we saw it was arising inside the community que ocorria em razão das meninas saírem de seus territórios, em razão da ausência de política, especialmente de educação dentro das comunidades, as meninas quilombolas saíram das comunidades para morar em casa de família e acabavam sendo exploradas sexualmente também é, só mão de tra no trabalho. And it's mainly because uh, those girls they lack of um, uh, education, so they had to go uh, leave the communities and then they suffer this kind of situation. A segunda razão foi a questão dos assassinatos, alto índice de assassinato de lideranças quilombolas no Brasil, em especial de mulheres. And the second reason uh, was the increase in murders in women leaders and women inside the community. É, em 2019, a Conac lançou a primeira pesquisa desfragmentada, né, sobre a, sobre é, tratando da violência e racismo contra quilombos no Brasil. So in, in 2019, uh, CONAC, my organization, uh, made a research specifically about this kind of murders and very violent practices. E um dos dados que mais chocavam, que chocou a sociedade brasileira foi uh, uh, um aumento de 35% de assassinato de mulheres quilombolas em, uh, que estavam atuando na liderança em, e principalmente pela crueldade dos assassinatos. 
And one fact that shocked everybody was that we had a 35% increase in murders of women leaders in considering the quilombolas uh, that were inside the leadership in Brazil. And also the type of crimes that was committed because it was very brutal. E a mais recente vítima do racismo brasileiro foi Mãe Bernadette, mulher liderança quilombola que lutava pela regularização de seu território por igualdade e contra empreendimentos racistas dentro da comunidade. Foi executada com 17 tiros no rosto. And uh, Bernadette was the most recent victim uh, of racism. She was a leader who fought for women's rights, especially uh, for the regularization of the land, the quilombo land. E ainda o assassinato dela continua sem resposta, né? And still we, we don't have uh, a response from the government about her, her killing, her murder, and she was murdered with 17 shots. E o fórum tem sido espaço importante para que a, as comunidades quilombolas tragam as questões também para que visibilize não só no Estado brasileiro, mas também mundialmente a situação do racismo com relação às comunidades quilombolas no Brasil. And the forum, GFOD, uh, is really is an important space for highlighting issues of racism and discrimination against the Quilombola communities. And uh, this highlight is not only nationally speaking, but also internationally. E no Brasil, apesar de ter regulações e reconhecendo o direito das comunidades quilombolas, ter regulações contra o racismo e contra a discriminação, pela própria estrutura social, o racismo, ele se constitui parte do... Estado, inclusive do próprio estrutura do Estado, que nega direito a essas comunidades. So, there are regulations that recognize rights in Brazil, of course, uh, but we, we can see that the racism is something that's really deep inside the government yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Verseline, Simona, and Bina for delivering uh, this important and extremely extremely powerful uh, statement. Um, I, I like this idea, let's put the money where the action is. Uh, this idea of investing in the communities that are indeed doing the work and the inclusive policy making. I mean, that's just key, it should be obvious, but I feel like we need to keep, uh, to keep repeating that. And just one last point that I really want to highlight is this, uh, and it came from all of you, this, staggering statistic on how marginalized women, women from racialized communities are disproportionately affected by sexual violence, exploitation, and even femicide. And we really need to rally to continue and accelerate our efforts to fight this. It's just not, not acceptable at all. Um, so Joshua, you're my last hope. Five minutes, right? <laughs> No pressure. No Joshua pressure. is the co-director of Minority Rights Group International, an organization with almost 300 partners in 60 countries with campaigns to ensure that disadvantaged minorities and indigenous peoples, often the poorest of the poor, can make the, their voice heard. Joshua, take Thank it away. Thank you very much, Patricia. Distinguished colleagues and panelists, it's a real honor to be here with you today. And I want to pay special testimony to Rita, who unfortunately couldn't be with us, but you really will hear her, I hope. And you should follow her on LinkedIn and Instagram and all the usual places where she is very active in the fight against racial discrimination. Colleagues, about in 1945, a few buildings away, a few streets away, the UN met to take on the mantle of decolonization. It was an impressive mantle because colonization and subjugation was the ultimate racist project. It wasn't the only European colonization, of course, wasn't the only type of colonization we've had, but European colonization created the architecture, the financial architecture for a society that was based on extraction that still persists today. Here we are 75 years later, and I would suggest to you that we have not decolonized. What we have done instead is passed power on from European colonizers to other dominant groups within lines drawn on maps where no European foot had ever trod. The consequence of this is that we have in our society entrenched structural discrimination that keeps certain groups based on whatever lineage you might think of, ethnicity, race, gender, status, sta status, nationality, and among them women in particular. It keeps all of these individuals based on their identity in a structural subjugated position, unable to access the fruits of human rights, 
that civil society has negotiated collectively. This is the challenge that we face today. But the challenge has been exacerbated by another quite significant element that has entered our society, and that is hate. Hate that is driven from political forces that tries to unite people in creating an artificial majority by picking on a scapegoat in order to put them down and gain political power. Many of those states now sit in the General Assembly across the road from where we are and talk about an anti-racial discrimination policy. So are they the right people to be able to address this? Or is their power base so deeply connected with their own dominant and gendered perspective of the world in which they have sought and gained their power? We will not be able to eliminate any kind of discrimination if we rely on state parties that have at their heart an agenda of hate that seeks to divide populations. It has been a pleasure and an honor to work with the Anti-Discrimination Network at the United Nations, to work with people like Emily, like others who, who we have on the panel today, and many others who understand that at the root cause of this discrimination we have here is the spreading and the continued spreading of hate with a view to subjugating populations that are far from sites of power. The human rights vision offers us a chance to make a difference, a chance that is based on respecting the inherent rights and dignity of every individual. And as you've heard from our colleagues here, especially uh, my sisters from, the, from civil society organizations, as you have heard, this is not a discrimination that happens by accident, and this is not a discrimination that happens only to individuals. It is experienced in a group, and it is experienced trebly or quintuply by women who are at the forefront of the hate that is permeating our societies. So the choice we have today is to strengthen the networks we have, to create preventative networks that are based on data that understand where the populations are that are being actively marginalized. Emily's point is an important one. The leave no one behind principle suggests that there's a bus that arrives and a whole bunch of people are trying to get on the bus and we have to make sure that nobody is left off the bus. But colleagues, there are monitors who are monitoring the queue for people who want to get on the bus and actively removing people from getting on the bus. These are communities being pushed further behind. And so no amount of accidental attempts to reach them will really work. But we have to take that agenda even further to generate the protection mechanisms that we need in our society to ensure that the agenda of hate will not win. And we have to also ensure that we monitor this at the highest level. So I leave you with the suggestion that there's three layers to this particular fight. First of all, at the macro level, to recognize that the violence being perpetrated today is still driven by commercial interests that ignore climate change and continue on an extractive, extractive, exploitative economic basis that creates our financial architecture. Many of the people and communities and violations we talk about are simply fodder in the way of a machinery that's profit-based. So we have to fight that at a macro level as individuals. We also want and support the work that the United Nations is doing, sitting in a sense alongside, but also above our sovereign states in holding account and holding those states account to the fact that we need to build a world where the inherent dignity and worth of every individual is respected. But the job also falls to each of us. And that job falls to each of us to contest where discrimination occurs. There is a very simple antidote to the provision of hate and the dissemination of hate. It's empathy. It's putting yourself in the place of the community or the individual that's most vulnerable in our society, seeing the world from their perspective and understanding the barriers that prevent them from accessing rights. We can do this. Other people have done this before us. The space that we got at the United Nations was based on the work of movements who are determined to eliminate the scourge of racism from our societies. Please don't be fooled into thinking that we have achieved that. The work is still there and the work is now, it's up to us to do it. We cannot rely on states only, we cannot rely on UN agencies only, but we have to all participate 
in holding society to account, because unless we respect the inherent dignity and worth of every individual, we simply have a new club of privilege, and we can't tolerate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you for keeping me time. And I mean, at the heart is the continued spreading of hate. But both as individuals and collectively, we have our role to play to change the status quo. Thank you for that, Joshua. And so finally, now we get to open the floor for questions, both from the room and um, our friends that have joined us virtually. We are a little behind schedule, so we have less time. So please make your questions really concise. Uh, no hiding speeches, you know, <laughs> on the questions. Um, and I will start with the gentleman right there. Thank you. Uh, I have a two questions. Very, I'll be very brief. One is you just mentioned a new club of privilege. That mean uh, that means us. You are talking about or someone else. Second is so uh, for UNDP. You talk about the more grants project. So these grants project, who are getting it? Dalit, marginalized people, the Janajati, ethnic people, LGBTQI, or who? So I want. I have these two questions. Thank you. I'll take one more and then I'll take one and then I'll take one from the Um, hi, my name is Uliania Polinario, and I work with Emily at UNFPA. Um, I'm not sure if the UN representative in Brazil is still online, but uh, maybe my colleagues from Brazil, I'm from Brazil, by the way, um, could also respond to, to, to my question or comment. Um, I was wondering uh, during the presentation, um, so how uh, is it the work with the uh, local authorities in, in Brazil, is particularly uh, regarding the indigenous uh, population, because I also always hear uh, there's a lot of uh, now, you know, the UN organizations are working a lot with uh, um, 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 uh, indigenous leaders. And uh, and I like right now we have a different scenario in Brazil where we have a federal government that is very, that is really like encouraging uh, taking action against the, uh, for, for in, in uh, towards the protection of the indigenous land and everything, but uh, what I know is that at the local level things are really really different, um, um, especially like in the stage that was mentioned by the by the even one more representative in Mato Grosso do Sul, which is a very very violent state. And uh, I had like colleagues that were went work there and received death threats, and uh, it's it's so. And and it's a state like it's really like uh, we, we used to call like the land of no one because uh, you the, you know the, the indigenous population or whoever is there doing work with the communities they're never safe because uh, it, there's a lot of violence coming from the state so it would be really interesting to to hear how is how is if anything changed from last year to this year with the work with like local authorities. And uh, the other comment that I have is that um, it's very, um, I, it's, I, I really would like to congratulate my colleague from Brazil uh, uh, like for this whole activism to the inclusion of quilombolas in the, in the census. I think that that's, uh, for me, some like I look at this and I feel so proud, but at the same time, I feel like, uh, you know, really just now, <laughs> you know, and thinking about like Afro-descendant people in Brazil, I'm Afro-descendant and we are not minority. You know that, you were agree with that we are not minority we are the like we like african pe the, the brazil is the country in in south america that has received the highest number of uh, african um in the, the period of slavery and uh, we we are not minority in brazil we are majority so yeah thank you very much for i would like to also to congratulate all the panelists this was like wonderful presentation and um yeah sorry for taking so much time i'll take one more question to end this round and then we'll answer. There's a button. Yeah. Uh, Paul Devaker with the Global Forum of Communities Discriminated on Work and Descent. Um, this is really exciting uh, to hear, excellent uh, presentations, and this whole aspect of it's not accidental, but it's really pushed down. And we see this as a glass ceiling. Uh, we say anti-racism, we say uh, inclusion, but there is a big uh, ceiling between the lip and the cup when it comes to communities, especially like caste, Kilambola, Roma, Gypsy, Sinti, 
uh, and there are several others. Uh, and these are not visibilized also in many countries, especially in Africa, uh, across the countries uh, within the same descent, then you have still the layer of caste, which has not sufficiently been in, uh, visibilized. Uh, and I think it is necessary uh, to have, I mean, research is there, but how do we make them and us together in order to see that the anti-racism, anti-discrimination uh, programming really reaches the communities? I think that is the a question that we'll have to really uh, look at, but congratulate uh, you in the sense that we are moving closer and really congratulate Rita and others who have visibilized some of these communities very boldly to see uh, that we we get to the point where it's not only visibilized and still there is a ceiling, but visibilized and actively engaged in these programs is very, very critical. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. So I'll ask our panelists to answer the questions concisely, please. I want to see if I can still use some of the questions from uh, our friends on uh, online as well. So I don't know who wants to start. Josh, do you want to start or? I'm happy. One was uh, one was directed at me. Are we privileged? Yes, we are. Privilege is a relative term and many are privileged, but human rights is not a relative term. Human rights is something that we understand in its civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Everybody, in, most, most people who are in New York City today, certainly in this week, are privileged. The question is to what extent can that be a position through which you can undermine the systematic privileging of certain groups? And I think that those of us who have opportunities like this and platforms like this have to make that privilege count in undermining the structure that keeps certain societies and individuals subjugated. Thank you, Shasha. There was, um, thank you for that. There was also a question on Brazil and then um, a question on the uh, who? Uh, thank you for the question regarding the Global Environment Facility, where UNDP has been programming for many, many years across the globe through the Small Grants Project. Now, in terms of the statistics that we have, by the way, I'll share with you the link to the website where you'll be able to see some of the disaggregation of the resources that are provided to communities. Because it's a small grants project, it is aimed at working with the grassroots, with communities, and more importantly, supporting those that have no access to financial services, you know, if we think about the normal uh, capitalized way of accessing uh, financial services. So data that we have from 2016 to 2022 reflects that of the work that we've been doing across the globe, around 6,994 indigenous leaders and communities participated in the various activities of the small grants project. And this has been done across 19 countries. So in terms of some of the detail of the disaggregation, I'll lead you to the website so that we can get some of that. But it's again, a very intentional uh, programming and exercise to really reach the grassroots and really empower and again, work with those most left behind. Thank you for that. Um, someone else wants to answer the question uh, asked from about Brazil? Yeah, I can start uh, and I would like to share this response with our dear partners from Konaki. So I'm very happy to be here with you and your partners and partners of Konaki. So I will start to respond to this question. Please, por favor, Cantina, sobre afrodescendentes, mulheres afrodescendentes. So uh, I would like uh, to ask, uh, to answer the part of the question which relates to indigenous population and uh, the work with the local authorities. So. Uh, the the local, uh, local authorities is automatic for all the UN agencies. I believe when we work with the, when our activities are rooted in the communities, we cannot work in isolation with the uh, rights holders. We definitely work with duty bearers. But uh, to, uh, the question was uh, uh, how much the situation has changed compared to the last year. I would like to say that. Uh, with all the advances such as establishment of the indigenous and uh, um, uh, racial equality machineries in the form of the Ministry of Indigenous People and Racial Equality at the federal level, establishment of the uh, uh, secretaries on indigenous affairs and racial equality at the state and municipal levels. Uh, so uh, the situation uh, cannot be resolved because we now are dealing with the legacy of the 500 years of oppression 
uh, colonial legacy, military dictatorship in Brazil. So within the period of one year, it's impossible to compensate. But we're happy to see that, that, uh, that, that these advances are taking place. And we definitely, from the side of the United Nations and UN Women, give credit to the persistence and continuity of the work of the civil society organizations and networks such as Amiga Indigenous Largest Network or Konaki, which is the largest network of Kilambola women. So we do see the changes, but not in terms of addressing uh, uh, the, the, those at the impact level. So they're all institutional at the moment or policy. Obrigada. É, obrigada pela questão. Acho que é muito importante a gente colocar que, é, por mais que no Brasil exista uma legislação que reconhece uma boa vontade do governo, efetivamente a política ela não acontece sem essa disputa de narrativa, essa disputa, essa luta dos movimentos, das populações que estão ali sendo descriminalizadas. So, it's important to highlight that we have public policies but the change really doesn't happen if the movements, the organizations like CONAC, if they don't act. E para e para mudar as estruturas, né, para que essas políticas efetivamente se construam para essas populações, é necessário que se mude também a estrutura do Estado. Mas também é necessário que se invista, né. Por mais que tenha, a gente está dando passos positivos politicamente, né, e o governo vem demonstrando essa boa vontade. Há uma necessidade de ter investimentos, principalmente nesses novos ministérios é que foram criados, porque não adianta criar um ministério se você não tem recursos humanos e nem orçamentário para poder fazer a política pública acontecer, né? E tudo continua na prática acontecendo do mesmo jeito e só visibilizando que criou isso e criou aquilo, mas na prática mesmo continua a mesma situação das populações. So, uh, we have uh, the creation of this this new uh, ministry in Brazil. So this is very positive, but what we really need is investment. Because if we don't have investment and a very uh, planned budget, uh, we cannot reach the communities and what is really has to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure if Paul's question was answered. And by the way, that question was also actually reflected in uh, a question online in um, the issue of including other uh, marginalized and racialized groups, so a, a larger group of communities that are being marginalized. And we have one last question that I'm going to ask from um, uh, online participants, and then we're going to wrap this up. So what is your process to concretely incorporate political analysis in your work? Can you please be specific in your answer, as people often refers to it generally, but operationally it ends up being absent. So inclusion of other groups and this idea of the political analysis in order to ask to make informed decisions uh, on the work that you're doing. Those are the two last questions. Thank you. And if we could please be concise. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Emily, I thought that you had your, your hand up. I did, but then you asked a very complex question, so I wasn't <laughs> sure I wanted to start. <laughs> um, so the first question on the poll, you were asking about meaningful uh, participation, not only, you know, how, how do we reach uh, these groups? And I think this is a challenge. And, and for the UN or organizations, you know, we, we tend to be big bureaucracies and there's not always our modalities, our administrative modalities are not always conducive in helping us have these financial and other partnerships with smaller grassroots organizations. So uh, for UNFPA, we, in our new strategic plan, we, for the first time, have a dedicated indicator on supporting feminists, uh, led, uh, feminist movements, women-led organizations, but wanted to go particularly for those that are representing uh, those furthest behind, um, and not as implementing partners, but as voices for change, which is a different way of working with civil society than, than a programming organization like UNFPA, and I'm sure and others you know you, you work with but then we found there was a challenge because our own programming modalities our partnership modalities make it hard to work with these small organizations so we've actually just um have have released a new partnership framework that is uh providing us with much more flexibility to work at the local level with smaller grassroots organizations that um are our movements of change movements of re representation and working with them 
in, in terms of their voice, but not as implementing partners. So I think this is the first step is, is our own kind of bureaucratic procedures to be able to make them more flexible. And Emily, I, think that's really I, I think I'm going to have to stop you on the first step. I think you Wait. can continue this okay. conversation uh, privately, but at very important points. And, and indeed, it was been great work that we're doing in NFPA to change that that status quo. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to take the, the political analysis question. And then we really want to five minutes more from you so that we can hear from Rita real quickly before everyone goes. So just give us a little bit more time. Uh, Josh, I see you. Happy yeah. to speak about the political question. I mean, at Minority Rights Group International, we work on a number of different elements that are essentially bring the political analysis. So looking at the extent to which the state itself is dominated by majoritarian groups, pulling apart the coalitions that are being built on hate, I think is key, but seeking accountability as well for those processes seeking to change international institutions' attitudes towards minorities, ethnic, religious, linguistic, racialized, indigenous, and very other, very many others, while emphasizing the analysis how women from all of these communities face discrimination both within their communities from a masculine system and also externally as minority women. But essentially, the, a la large part of what we do is political. And if, in a sense, it is the politics that has to change, it is the political will that has to be shifted. And we have to bring this analysis to vast majorities of people to build the kind of empathy that we need if we are to envisage the society we want to live in. Thank you, Thank you so much for that, Joshua. And before we go, Rita, we really want to hear from you. So please uh, close us up. Thank you, colleagues. Can you see me or hear me in the room? Oh. <laughs> Okay, I can't see myself, so I have to assume that um, I'm there. So thank you so much. I'm so happy and so overwhelmed by all these testimonies and statements. And I think it was such an enriching meeting. It would be impossible for me to summarize what we have discussed, but I just wanted to maybe reflect a little bit on what we need to move forward, right? And you mentioned intentionality and resources and commitment. And it also links to Joshua's last um, uh, thoughts about allyship and courage. And I think that we do need to acknowledge here that when we talk about anti-racism work, especially at this high level and sometimes very political levels, we need to build up the courage because we are talking about racist systems. These are racist setups, right? And when we talk about structural and, and systemic and, and institutionalized forms of racism, it means that very often these structures we have to deal with are also um, composed of the society's elites and they are not necessarily people who understand where we come from and what we want to achieve. And so I really would want us to um, be encouraged to expand our networks, to keep on building allies, I believe that there are allies in governments, that are allies in parliaments, of course, in NGOs, at the UN system, also in businesses, also in security um, forces. So we need to really expand this allyship and we need to build our collective strength and forces so that we can come forward and we can really address racism where it is embedded and where it, where it all originates. And so I think like today's meeting was one of those steps when we are all coming together, when we all um, form future desires to work together, to, to build this together, to push forward. And I'm very happy that we start this journey, we continue this journey, and I'm looking forward to work with you. And just the practical information, as you know, we are um, planning to uh, record all these statements in a conference room report. So nothing will be lost. Also the chats were monitored and the questions are there. And of course we can't um, have, Unfortunately, everything we answered because of the short time limits, but we're going to continue this. And please let us know if you want to receive the updates in the future and we will be in touch with you. Thank you so much to all of you. It was really such an uplifting event and I'm I'm, I'm very, very glad that, that we made this. Thank you. Thank you, Rita, indeed, to be continued. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here and virtually. Please have some coffee and some breakfast.